we can agree that uh, HD base T is, a, I mean, it's an amazing technology that allows us to pass all these five things, when in the past, all we could really pass was audio and video. Uh, but as a manufacturer, recently, over the past couple of years, we've actually had a handful of revelations about all the technologies that surround HDMI that these different things that if implemented correctly can really make the HDMI experience much, much better. Um, and HDMI, if you've ever dealt with it, especially installing, if you don't necessarily know what you're doing, HDMI really is a four-letter word. Uh, and it comes with a lot of issues and the four-letter words that surround it, like EDID and HDCP. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you don't know necessarily how to deal with these certain things, it, does, it can cause some problems. So what we've kind of put together is this training that identifies four or five different things that really are instrumental in co correctly implementing HDMI. Uh, so there is good news. I mean, there's only three places that HDMI can have potential problems. It's either in your sources, in your display devices, or in everything in between. Unfortunately, that kind of encompasses everything, but there is some good news here. Uh, so initially, the, the first problem is your, your, your source problems. Uh, and this is basically the quest for the $99 Blu-ray player. And this is on the consumer side and the professional side, but everybody is trying to drive down costs and make things less and less expensive. Uh, and as they drive down costs, they're driving down the quality of the components that go into these Blu-ray players. So everybody's looking for that $99 Blu-ray player. Uh, and they're cutting costs all over the place. I mean, a Blu-ray player has a mechanical tray. It has uh, a metal enclosure. It has a laser that can cut your head off inside. I mean, it's got a lot of expensive components inside that thing. And where they're cutting costs is sometimes in these HDMI uh, transmitter or, or output uh, drivers. And the, the issue that, that, that it causes is because there's so much variability between all these different uh, HDMI drivers, there's variability between which DVD player might work with your installation and which DVD player might not. And it's all about what driver that they actually put in this, uh, in this product. Uh, and it's inconsistent from device to device. And that's why a Blu-ray player from Sony might work today and a Panasonic Blu-ray player uh, may not work tomorrow. Uh, and remember that the rule of thumb as far as HDMI is concerned, the spec is six feet. I mean, the idea is to stick a Blu-ray player on a table that sits right beneath your display device. You run a six foot cable up to your display and that's about as far as they're willing to take you. Uh, on the display side, it's the same thing. It's, it's, those, it's those cost wars uh, and it's where can we save money here and where can we save money there? And it's the HDMI EQ chips that go on the inputs of the display devices that do the same thing. The HDMI EQ chips are basically what takes a sig an HDMI signal that's come over a longer cable run that's maybe degraded a little bit and it resquares all those waves so that it can go into the display device. The display device knows exactly what, it, what to do with it and it can display an image. But remember the rule of thumb here is six feet. If you're running more than six feet, that's when you run into issues. Now uh, we've also seen it on the same display where to cut costs in a consumer display, they know that most consumers are only gonna connect one HDMI cable. So on HDMI input one, they've put an EQ chip. So back in our office, we actually took a Blu-ray player, 50 feet of HDMI cable on a Kramer cable, uh, went up to a display device, input one worked perfectly. As soon as we went to input two, three, or four, we didn't get a signal at all. And the reason for that is because to, to, to cut down on some of those costs, they put that EQ chip on input one because that's the one that everybody's gonna use, and two, three, and four didn't have that EQ chip. So if you're using a six foot cable, you don't have any issues. But with a 50 foot cable, now you have problems. And this display, this display manufacturer is not alone. I'm not gonna say any names or anything, but it, it, it happens on more than one display. So just be careful about the products that you do implement. And then you have all the products in between, these signal management products, these products that get you from point A to point B. Um, and they can do a number of things. They can either help you or hurt you, depending on who you're using and how you're using it. Uh, but the questions always come down to how do we fix it and who's causing the problem. And troubleshooting can kind of be a pain. Um, so Kramer's kind of come up with these four things, and, and Kramer's not alone here, but these are the four things that we really think that if you understand them correctly, can really improve your uh, HDMI experience. Uh, and the first is, is reclocking and equalization. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about bandwidth, uh, which is gonna go into a little bit of color depth and how to calculate bandwidth so that we know that all the products from point A to point B are all capable of passing the bandwidth and the signal that we're trying to, to send. Uh, we're gonna talk about HDC uh, management and EDID a little bit, our other two, uh, other two four letter words. Uh, so the first thing I wanna discuss is uh, reclocking and equalization. And if you're not familiar, this is what an HDMI signal looks like through a scope. It's what they call the eye pattern. And as a <coughs> signal is pushed over a cable, the attenuation in that cable has a tendency to close down that eye pattern and round all those square edges. And if those, 
if those edges of that, that square wave get so rounded that the display device doesn't know how to interpret it anymore, then that's when you get either a flashing image or no image at all. Uh, digital signals are very different than analog signals, where analog signals you could run a country mile, and at the other end, if you just adjust your level and equalization, you could probably fix for any kind of smearing or softness, but you're always going to get an image on the other side. With HDMI and digital signals, because it's all ones and zeros, they have something called the cliff effect. And the cliff effect is, okay, at 50 feet, you got a pretty good signal. At 51 feet, you have a little bit of digital snow. And at 52 feet, that signal's completely gone. And it's not always 50 feet or so, but it's as soon as that signal gets out of that range that you're going to lose it altogether. So equalization is actually the process of taking this square, this, this wave that's kind of been rounded and that eye pattern's closing down and using it as a template to create a perfectly good signal out the other side. So the same way you can take a, a sentence like this that says, well, it's kind of gibberish, but you know what it says, and output the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. That's kind of the, the idea of, of recocking and equalization. Uh, Kramer makes a, uh, a, a reclocker in a box, and most, most professional AV equipment, uh, like switchers and distribution amplifiers, even twisted pair transmitters and receivers, will have reclocking and equalization. But you do have to take a look and make sure that the manufacturer does say that it does have reclocking and equalization on the inputs and the outputs. Um, so this is just a standalone device. It's about the size of a matchbox car that is a reclocker and equalizer in a, in a can. What it does is it basically fixes those two problems. You have that Blu-ray player that has an inconsistent output or that's only designed for 60 feet. You run that six foot cable into this reclocker here. Now you have a good strong signal that you can run 50 feet or, or 100 feet or however far you need to go. Uh, also you get that display device that inputs two, three, and four don't have any reclocking or equalization. You put this before you go into the display device and now you can correct for any of those, those limitations. Understanding bandwidth. Uh, HDMI bandwidth is, uh, well, it's a little bit different. In the analog world, we, we had to deal with bandwidth for a certain amount of time, but then matrix switchers and things like that got so, th they, they had so much bandwidth that was available that bandwidth wasn't necessarily a problem anymore. The resolutions that we were pushing were way below the bandwidth specifications of the matrix switcher, so we didn't have to worry about calculating it anymore. HDMI signals now are so intense and they carry so much information that bandwidth is kind of back. And, and as installers and integrators and system designers, you have to be able to be proficient in understanding how bandwidth is calculated to ensure that all the components in between have enough bandwidth to support the signal that you're sending. Obviously, a 720p signal doesn't require quite as much bandwidth as something like 1080p. You're sending more pixels, you're sending more information. When you get into color depth and things like that, and the amount of pix or the amount of information that we use to describe a specific pixel, that exponentially increases the amount of bandwidth that, that, that we're going to use. Um, so there's some things that do in fact uh, affect bandwidth, and, and there are these four things here. It's, it's resolution, it's frame rate, uh, it's color depth, and it's whether or not you're sending 3D. Uh, so the problem mainly is that if you have a product or a product that, doesn't, that has a certain bandwidth limitation and the requirement exceeds that bandwidth limitation, then that's when you're going to not get an image on the other side. So for example, maybe you have a product that supports 1.65 gigabits per second. And you have a signal like 1080p60 at 12-bit color, which bandwidth is over 2 gigabits per second. Well, because that bandwidth exceeds the limitation of the product, you're not going to get a picture on the other side. The, the information that you're trying to send is too big for the pipe that you're trying to send it down. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how you calculate bandwidth. And it is a, it's a mathematical equation, but the thing to remember is that it, when bandwidth required exceeds bandwidth available, the signal's not passed. So like I said, bandwidth is a, it's a mechanical, or it's a, it's a mathematical uh, equation. Um, and it basically is, it, bandwidth is the pixel clock times the color depth plus two. And if, if, you, if any of you are interested in getting this presentation afterwards, I don't, I don't need you to necessarily understand exactly how to calculate bandwidth. I just want to make sure you're aware of bandwidth uh, limitations. Uh, so the first thing we need to calculate is pixel clock. And pixel clock is, is calculated by the total number of horizontal pixels times the total number of vertical pixels times the refresh rate. Uh, now, when we talk about a signal like 1920 by 1080, what we're actually talking about is the active video signal that we're seeing on the screen. But above and beyond that active video s image that we're seeing is the total amount of pixels. That, that, that kind of hides behind the scene that allows us to perfectly center that image on the screen, make sure we're not seeing any blanking area or anything like that. So for an image like 1920 by 1080, the total number of horizontal and vertical pixels is 2200 by 1125. So to get our pixel clock, we actually multiply 2200, which are, is our horizontal total pixels, times 1125, which is our 
vertical total pixels times the refresh rate, which we know here is 60. So all that multiplied together gives us a pixel clock of 148.5 megahertz. So once we have the pixel clock, we can go on and calculate the rest of the bandwidth. Uh, the next thing we're going to take into account is something called color depth. Uh, and color depth is basically, it's defined here, the number of bits used to represent a color of a single pixel on an image. So this projector has a certain number of pixels. Each one of those pixels has the ability to be any number of colors. And the amount of information that we use to describe that color is what we call color depth. Uh, and obviously, the more colors that we have, or the more, more colors that we can use, the less artifacts you're going to have on the screen, the smoother transition you're going to have between two different colors. Uh, obviously, the more colors that we use, the more bandwidth that it's going to require. Uh, and if you've heard the term deep color, deep color, all deep color refers to is um, basically 16-bit or 48-bit color depth. And it's, it's actually more colors than the human eye can even see. Um, but if you think of color depth as a box of crayons, you take a box of eight crayons, you can make X amount of colors. You take a box of 64 crayons now, and you can make exponentially more colors. But you can also see how describing a, a pixel by either 8 bits or 64 bits is going to exponentially increase it, because now you have X amount of pixels that you're going to have described that many different ways. So once we, once we know how to calculate bandwidth, we can look at how it affects the, the amount of bandwidth that, that we're trying to send. So you take a, an, an image like 1080p60 at 8-bit color, a normal color depth. We get a color, uh, bandwidth of 1.485 gigabits per second. Now, just by increasing the color depth, so we're not increasing the resolution on the, on the screen, but we're increasing the number of bits we're using to describe each individual color, you can see it pushes the bandwidth up over 2 gigabits per second. So you have to make sure that the products that you're using in between your Blu-ray player and your, uh, and your display device are able to support this kind of bandwidth. So you take two Kramer products here. You have a maximum bandwidth for this twisted pair transmitter of 1.65 gigabits per second, or this repeater down here that's 2.25. Well, on that previous slide, if we're using 8-bit color, both of these products are going to have no problem passing that image. But once we go up to 12-bit color, or we get into these deeper colors, well, now this twisted pair transmitter here is going to struggle. So the only, the only solution there is either to turn off deep color or, or lower your resolution. So here's your problem. I mean, you have a, a Blu-ray player connected to some type of HDMI matrix switcher, and you have a, a display device on the other side. So this display device says, hey, I'm native 1080p60. I support 12-bit color. That information is passed through the matrix switcher back to the Blu-ray player. The Blu-ray Blu player says, hey, I, I can support that. I'll send a 1080p60 at 12-bit color band, uh, bandwidth of 2 gigabits per second. The problem is now your matrix switcher only has 1.65 gigabits. So now you've, you've, you've introduced a product that doesn't support the bandwidth. So now you're not going to get an image on the other side. And you could have all your connections the right way. You could have EDID being passed. You could have HDCP being passed. But now you have bandwidth that's causing an issue. So you just have to be aware that the bandwidth that you're required or you're, that you're requiring is, is, is available. So there's, there's a couple ways to avoid deep color. Uh, Obviously, you can go into most Blu-ray players and actually turn off deep color. So you can, it's, it's normally set to auto, where that EDID information is passed back from the display device that says, I can, I can support deep color. You can actually go in there and turn it from auto to off, so that it will only send regular color depths. And as I said before, deep color is something that, to the human eye, you're not necessarily going to be noticed, notice, but people hear it as a buzzword, and they, they need to have it. The other thing you can do is you can lower the frame rate of the Blu-ray player from 60 hertz to 24 hertz. Now, if you think about the information that's on a Blu-ray disc, the information that resides on a Blu-ray disc is 1080p 24. So somebody has to take that 1080p 24 image and scale it up from 1080p 24 to 1080p 60. If you're doing that in the Blu-ray player, now you're asking everything downstream to pass a signal that's high in bandwidth. If you pass a 1080p 24 signal, which is what's native on that disk, over all these other components, which you can see is a much, much lower bandwidth than, than, the, than the regular 60, 60 hertz, you can do the scaling at the display device. The display device is still going to take that 1080p 24 image and scale it up to 1080p 60. So in the long run, you're still going to get the same image on the display device, but now you've asked all the components in the middle to pass a, a less intensive signal. So if we take a look at it here, 1080p 60 at 12-bit color is over 2 gigabits. But 1080p 24, which we know that at the far end we're still going to get the same quality, at 12-bit color, is less than one gigabit per second. So now we can use that matrix switcher, and it's not going to be an issue. We can actually pass 16-bit color on that same matrix switcher, where, where with 1080p60, we, can only pass, we can't even pass 12. So here's that same application again. 
This, this uh, display device says I'm native 1080p60, I support 12-bit color. Well, this Blu-ray player says, hey, I, they, turn, they turned off my deep color, I'm only gonna pass 8-bit color. So now 8-bit color's passed at a bandwidth that's acceptable by the matrix switcher, and you get a picture on the other side. So it's all about how you implement all these different products and being aware of how bandwidth can affect your signal that's gonna make this experience a little bit better for you. All right, the next thing I wanna discuss is, is HDCP. Uh, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with HDCP, but HDCP stands for High Bandwidth Digital Content Protection. Uh, this is a two-way handshake, it, and it basically goes from the Blu-ray player or source device on one side all the way through every component in the middle to the display device on the other side. And it's a constant bi-directional handshake. This is gonna happen about every two seconds. Uh, and while that handshaking is maintained and everybody's happy, you're gonna get a good signal. It's when you have that, that HDCP breakdown that you're not gonna get a picture on the other side. So when we talk about HDCP, there's three different types of keys we talk about. We talk about source keys, which is what's, what are gonna reside in your source devices like Blu-ray players or computers or cable boxes. They basically encrypt that HDMI signal and they send it downstream. There are repeater keys, which, which, which are what are you gonna find in, uh, inside the display? Excuse me, inside anything that goes in between, like AV receivers or audio de embedders or maybe some distribution amplifiers, that kind of a thing. Uh, and then there are sync keys, and sync keys are what you're gonna find in your display devices. They basically de decrypt it, that, uh, that information and they're gonna be able to display it on the screen. So here's your typical home HDCP implementation. You have a Blu-ray player that sits on a desk, you run a short six foot cable up to your display device, this is gonna work 100% of the time because all devices that are HDCP compliant are gonna be able to exchange that handshake and everybody's gonna be happy. Here's maybe a home theater uh, implementation where you have a source device that goes into uh, like a Blu-ray player that goes into an AV receiver or something like that that then goes up to a display device. This is gonna work almost 100% of the time. And I'll tell you why I say almost 100% of the time in just a second. But for the most part, because you have a, a handshake that, goes, that gets all the way through, it's gonna work just about every time. Of course, in, in our world, that's never really the case. When is it ever one-to-one? -one? When do you ever just have a Blu-ray player going up to a TV? That's never ever the case. This is more of the concept of, of HDCP, uh, maybe a distribution amplifier, where you have a Blu-ray player that you need to send to four different TVs. Uh, so what happens here is this source device gets ready to send a signal. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna send uh, a signal downstream and it's gonna say, hey, are you HDCP compliant? It's gonna hit these repeater keys in this distribution amplifier, and these repeater keys know that they need to return the sync keys that are all the way downstream. So what's gonna happen is each one of these HDMI displays is gonna pass back, back its sync key to this HDMI uh, source device. And it's gonna get four HDCP sync keys back and it's gonna say, okay, you're good, you're good, you're good, you're good, okay, now I can send my signal. And once it's satisfied, it'll send a, an image to, to all these different displays. So there's some issues that go along with this concept of HDCP. The first issue is that there's a large percentage of sources, namely cable boxes, that only want to support one key. They want a one-to-one -one connection. They want to sit on your table, they want to hook directly up to your display device, and, and that's as far as they want to go. So as soon as they get back more than one sync key, they say, hey, this is not what I was designed for. They turn off their output. Uh, the second problem is that there's a large number of sources that don't support repeater keys. As soon as they see a repeater key, they say, hey, this is not what I was designed for. I only want to see a sync key. I'm turning off my signal. That's problem number two. Number three is what happens if one of these displays is non-HDCP compliant? What happens if somebody swaps out this HDMI display here for a non-HDCP compliant DVI display? Well, now it's going to get back three good keys and one bad key. And because the Blu-ray player has no way to tell this distribution amplifier, hey, outputs one, two, and four are good, but three is no good, it says something's not right here, I'm turning off my output. Now you have an entire installation that has gone down because one display is not HDCP compliant. So there's a handful of manufacturers who have figured out a better way to handle HDCP. Uh, and that's without using repeater keys at all. Uh, Kramer's one of these manufacturers and there are a number of other manufacturers in the industry that do HDCP handling the same way that Kramer does. Um, but you'll notice that there's no repeater keys here. What, what's happening is there is a one-to-one -one handshake at, all, at every single input and every single output. So what's happening is this source device makes a handshake with the input of this distribution amplifier and it satisfies that, that, uh, that handshake. And on the output side, the source device speaks to this, this or excuse me, this, this output of this display has a source key that speaks to the sync key on the display device that satisfies that handshake. So everywhere there's a one-to-one -one handshake. So we've eliminated all three problems. The first one is cable boxes that only want to talk to one output. Well, we're satisfying this handshake here. As far as this cable box is concerned, it's talking to one, one, uh, one output. 
Uh, the second one is no repeater keys are supported. Obviously, we don't, we don't have repeater keys here. It's not going to be an issue. And the last one is a non-HDCP compliant device is, is introduced. You put a, a DVI display here that's non-HDCP compliant. Well, this handshake breaks down. But this handshake stays maintained, and now all three of your other displays are, are still up and running. So you have a much more reliable installation. And everybody asks, well, aren't you kind of getting around the way that HDCP is handled? Everybody always asks that question. And the HDCP is all about copyright protection. It's all about content protection. So if somebody was to put an HDMI recorder on any one of the outputs of this distribution amplifier, that handshake's still going to break down. We're not allowing anybody to copy any of the information. The only place that the information is decrypted is inside our circuitry. So it's not necessarily a problem. So it's just a much more robust, reliable way to handle HDCP handshaking. So it's important to understand how you're, the manufacturers that you're using are handling this HDCP handshaking to ensure that the products that you're using are going to work with it. All right, the last thing I want to discuss real quick is uh, EDID management. And uh, EDID stands for Extended Display Identification Data. Uh, and it's another two-way communication. What happens is when I take my laptop here and I plug it directly into this projector, there's information coming from this projector telling my laptop, hey, I'm this make and model, these are my color characteristics, this is my native resolution, this is what I really want you to send me. And it's a beautiful thing. It creates a plug and play environment so that when you walk in and plug your computer directly into this projector, my computer not only knows to automatically output, but it outputs a perfectly good picture. So we've got that plug and play environment. So when there's a breakdown in that EDID information, when that EDID information doesn't make it from that projector to my laptop here, one, my computer's not going to automatically output, but two, I'm going to have to tell it what resolution to output, and I'm going to have to tell it when to output. Uh, it's also important to note that EDID is carried over what they call the data display channel. It's the DDC lines. On a VGA connector, it's pins 12 and 15. Uh, and on an HDMI connector, I'm not sure what pins it is, but that DDC information, or that DDC channel is what passes that EDID information. So if you think of EDID as the train, DDC is the railroad tracks. So EDID is a, it's a block of 100, either 128 or 256 bytes of information. Uh, like I said, it travels on the DDC line, uh, and it makes all these capabilities of the display device known. So it's monitor information and color characteristics, and then it has two sets of resolution timings. There's standard resolutions, and then there's detailed resolutions uh, that I'm going to get into in a little bit of detail in just a second. Uh, but it's also something that's put into the display devices by their manufacturers. So this is not something that's standardized in the industry. It's Sharp putting it in their displays and Sony putting it in their displays. I mean, it could be different from manufacturer to manufacturer. It could be different from model to model. Uh, we actually use a free program that, uh, for any installer, I really recommend downloading. It's, it's a program called the Monitor Asset Manager. And if you just Google the words Monitor Asset Manager, uh, it allows you to read EDID in plain English. So this, this block over here is actually the EDID information. Um, but the information that we're more concerned with or that we can actually, is human readable, is the information on the right-hand side here. So you can see when I captured this, I was connected to a Sony display device, and it tells me the EDID revision and color characteristics. Uh, and it even tells me, more importantly, the timing characteristics. So down here, we have the native and preferred timing information. So what this is, is this is the native resolution of the display device that I'm connected to. So it tells me that this display device really wants to see 1920 by 1200 at 60 hertz. Uh, and above and beyond that, it gives me this mode line. And this mode line provides all these other numbers that tell my computer's graphics card, hey, I'll put 1920 by 1200, but I'll put 1920 by 1200 this way so that when I get it, I know exactly what I need to do with it. And then below that is uh, these standard timings, which the standard timings, and actually we can do this on the, on the next slide here, uh, standard timings are all those ticks on your graphics card. So when you go into your graphics card and go to change your, out, out, your output resolution, you'll see eight or ten different ticks. Standard resolutions are a list of resolutions that the display device can support, what it's willing to support. So even though your display device may be native 1280 by 720, it can probably support 1024 by 768 and 800 by 600 and a couple other resolutions in there as well. So those are the standard uh, timings. And standard timings have been in the industry for so long that they've been what, standardized. Uh, something like 1024 by 768, there's only one version of 1024 by 768. So you can tell a computer's graphics card, hey, I'll put 1024 by 768. And giving it, by giving it that minimal amount of information, it knows that mode line. Because it's been around for as long as it has, it's standardized. So those numbers are always the same from the display to display. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, so there's, no, more, there's no, no, no need to provide all that other detailed information for standard timings because there's only one version. Detailed timings are a little bit more complicated. Uh, detailed timings are all these newer widescreen resolutions. They're your 1280 by 800 or your 1920 by, by 1080 or your 1680 by 1050. Um, 
these resolutions have only been in the industry for a short amount of time and there's no standards. There's no standard version of 1920 by 1080. It, it's different from display to display. It may be different from model to model. It may be different from manufacturer to manufacturer. Uh, and all the information that it's providing there, it's, it's providing dimension of horizontal and vertical blanking periods and vertical and horizontal sync pulses and active pixels and even sync polarity and pixel clock. All this information down here is important to the graphics card so that it outputs the right information. Uh, so if we take a look at a, at, a, at a video signal, the active video, here's your 1920 by 1080 right here. That's your active video. But all those numbers go into perfectly spacing that video signal so that it fits perfectly on the screen. You can imagine that if I told my computer to output 1920 by 1080, but I didn't tell it that other information, and it's guessing at this horizontal width here, if it gets it too small or too big, that's when you're going to get an image shift on your screen. So you, get, you, you may be outputting 1920 by 1080, and I know that's the native resolution of this display device, but because I'm not giving it all that other information, now I have an image that either doesn't fit the screen or it shifts off to one side. And this is why it's as important as it is. I mean, here's five display devices that we have in our facility back in New Jersey. Uh, they're all 1920 by 1080. Now, if you take a look at the mode line for each one of these display devices, you won't find one that's identical. So you can see why it would be an issue that if EDID is not passed from my display device back to my computer, that my computer would have to basically guess as to what it's outputting. If I told it to output 1920 by 1080, how does my computer know, hey, I'll put, I'll put, this, I'll put this version of 1920 by 1080, or I'll put this, res this version of 1920 by 1080. If we're not giving it all that other information, that's when we have an image that doesn't necessarily fit the screen. So the number one question that everybody always asks is, how is it possible that all these manufacturers can get away without a standard? Or, or how can they all have their own different timings? Well, these display manufacturers, they design this display with the intent of you taking a computer with a fully populated cable and plugging it directly into their display device. They know that if that connection is happening, they can rely on EDID to tell every single computer computer exactly what to output. And because, because EDID is there, that's what, makes it, that, that's what makes it work every single time. Uh, the other thing is that computers have the ability to output any resolution as long as the EDID tells them what to do. So here's your, your perfect example. You have a 1920 by 1080 display on the right-hand side. You're connected with a, an, an HDMI cable. You have EDID that comes from the display device, tells my computer, hey, I'm 1920 by 1080, here's all my EDID information. That computer sends a perfectly good 1920 by 1080 picture back and you get a perfectly good image. So the thing to remember is that just because we're going digital, HDMI, DisplayPort, uh, DVI, doesn't necessarily mean it make it bulletproof. You have to make sure that the products in between are managed for EDID, or you have the ability to store or pass EDID information back. It gets a little tricky when you start going through distribution amplifiers and matrix switchers and things like that. So maybe you have an HDMI distribution amplifier that doesn't support EDID information or doesn't have the ability to store EDID information. So you have EDID passed back from the display devices. They can try all day long to pass that EDID information. But if that matrix switcher doesn't pass that EDID information back to this computer, the computer can only guess as to what it really needs to output. So now you have a computer that may, that's maybe outputting 1366 by 768, and now you get an image that doesn't necessarily fit your screen. Where if that EDID path was completed all the way back to the display device, then you'd know you'd be getting all that EDID information, and you'd get a picture that would work perfectly on the screen. Or maybe you're actually getting 1920 by 1080. But maybe you're getting a version of 1920 by 1080 that, that the display device doesn't necessarily understand. Because that EDID information isn't making it back, yeah, the computer can output 1920 by 1080. But it's going to default to whatever 1920 by 1080 the graphics card manufacturer put in its memory, not necessarily the one that the display device wants to see. So you have to be sure that the switches and distribution amplifiers that you're installing in your installation have EDID management. And most professional AV equipment is EDID manageable. Uh, for example, a lot of HDMI matrix switches have the ability to store EDID at each one of the inputs. So what you can actually do is store the EDID from your display device at each one of the inputs so this handshake is taking place. So when you plug a computer into input one, as far as it's concerned, it's plugged directly into the display device. So it's seeing all that EDID information from the, from the display and it's passing it back to the, the, to the computer and the computer's outputting the video signal that the display wants to see. Now, just because it has the ability to manage EDID doesn't necessarily mean that right out of the box this is going to be a bulletproof solution. The only reason I say that is because out of the box that, that, that product here is not going to know what, what the EDID of your display is. So you actually may have to look in your user manual for this matrix switcher or, or distribution amplifier and learn how to store the EDID information. It's usually a one or two step process but it will be probably a step that you have to take in order to make sure that EDID is available. 
The other thing is you have to choose wisely. I mean, display selection is as important as everything else in the puzzle. And the reason I say that is a computer can only output one resolution at a time. So if you're connected to a distribution amplifier, and on the output of that distribution amplifier, you have two different display devices with two different native resolutions. If you choose to store the EDID of your 1280 by 720 display in here, the EDID is going to be passed back to your computer. You're going to get a, a, an EDID that says, hey, output 1280 by 720. Your computer's going to output 1280 by 720. This display device is going to be, hey, I'm happy. I, I'm getting exactly what I want to see. This 1920 by 1080 display device is probably going to be able to display 7, 1280 by 720. Now, if you did the reverse and you actually stored the EDID of your 1920 by 1080 display here, this computer is going to see that, that EDID. It's going to output a 1920 by 1080 signal. This display device is going to be happy. But this 1280 by 720 display device doesn't know how to output or to display 1280 or 1920 by 1080. Uh, so you have to just be careful about which is the EDID that you do store there, especially when you get into multiple displays. So I just want to make sure that you're aware that display selection is as important as any other piece of the puzzle because if your displays are not all aligned, then you're going to run into issues where you're going to have to choose that highest common denominator of a, of a display resolution in order to get a picture on both, on both, uh, both displays. The last thing I would just want to highlight real quick is if you haven't heard of the analog sunset, I'd really recommend taking about 10 minutes and just Googling the words analog sunset. Basically what it says is any Blu-ray player manufactured after 2010, which is currently, the standard definition outputs, so that component video output, or excuse me, the, the analog outputs, that component video output is only good for standard definition. So starting in 2010, the analog output of most Blu-ray players is only going to give you 480i. You're not going to get 720p anymore out of your Blu-ray player component video output, which is why it's as important as it is to go to digital now to future-proof your installations. Uh, the other thing is ma players manufactured after 2013, and that's kind of a, uh, a rough date, uh, but you're not going to see an analog output anymore. All you're going to see is digital outputs, and the reason for that is if, in an analog world, if you can see it and you can hear it, you can copy it. Where at least in the digital side of things, they can, they can kind of control a little bit. Um, so the, if, the other thing is if you're thinking, hey, I already have a Blu-ray player. I bought it in 2008. It outputs component video on, at, at 720p. I don't have a problem. Well, they can actually do it on a per disk basis. So they can actually flag what they call the image constraint token on the disk itself so that when you go out and buy the newest copy of the Hangover 2 and bring it home and put it in your Blu-ray player, that image constraint token, if it's flagged on that Blu-ray on that Blu-ray disc, can actually tell your Blu-ray player, hey, if you want to watch this video, you can only watch it in standard definition out of the component video outputs and high definition out of the digital outputs. And in the future, they're going to be able to flag the digital only token, which does the exact same thing, except, except it says that component video output cannot be used for this disc. It can only be used uh, out of the digital output. So real quick in conclusion, uh, we talked about reclocking and equalization, which basically corrects for any signal degradation over a cable. You want to make sure that all your products that go between your source device and your sync devices have the ability to reclock and EQ uh, the video signals so that you can ensure quality over the longer, longer runs. Um, we talked about bandwidth, and bandwidth uh, incorporates resolution, frame rate, and color depth. Uh, and you need to stay within the limitations of the products that go in between. Uh, and we talked about a couple ways to uh, to overcome any kind of deep color issues. Uh, we talked about HDCP. HDCP is that two-way bi-directional handshake that happens about every two seconds. Anytime there's a breakdown in that handshake, you're not going to get a picture. We also talked about EDID management, uh, where basically if you have no connection for EDID information there, you're probably going to get the wrong picture or you're not going to get a picture immediately. So this time, if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to, to answer. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I'll leave you a business card, and if you shoot me an email, I'd be more than happy to send it to you. So, so what can uh, the industry expect uh, now that you're starting to use the HD-based stuff? How are you going to address all these issues? Are those issues are going to be uh, solved with HD-based Well, I mean, the beautiful thing about HD-based T uh, is HD-based T passes EDID information, passes HDCP, has 10.2 gigabits of bandwidth. So all these things that I've kind of talked about here, if you're using HD base T from point to point, not going to be an issue because it has the ability to pass all that information. I'm only making you aware of the things outside of HD base T that maybe you're using HD base T to get from your Blu-ray player to a matrix switcher and then you're doing the matrix switching on an HDMI matrix switcher. If that matrix switcher isn't capable of passing all that bandwidth or doesn't handle EDID or HDCP the right ways, that's when you're going to run into issues. If you're using HD base T from point A to point B, that's a great solution because you're not going to have any issues. So, so 
So sure. You, I mean, I'm not sure if the question is to you or to both of you, but if you had an HP, uh, an HP based T switch, in theory, uh, should it should it by standard pass all these information? Absolutely. Or, or would it be? I mean, is it a standard requirement for H for HP based T or 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 not? Well, HD base T is the full bandwidth, and it's going to be able to manage all that information. Exactly. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much.